This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Preface of the Author. It is not my intention to detain the reader by expatiating on the variety or the importance of the subject, which I have undertaken to treat, since the merit of the choice would serve to render the weakness of the execution still more apparent and still less excusable. But as I have presumed to lay before the public a first volume only of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, it will perhaps be expected that I should explain, in a few words, the nature and limits of my general plan. The memorable series of revolutions, which in the course of about thirteen centuries gradually undermined, and at length destroyed, the solid fabric of human greatness, may with some propriety be divided into the three following periods. The first of these periods may be traced from the age of Trajan and the Antonines, when the Roman monarchy, having attained its full strength and maturity, began to verge toward its decline, and will extend to the subversion of the Western Empire by the barbarians of Germany and Scythia, the rude ancestors of the most polished nations of modern Europe. This extraordinary revolution, which subjected Rome to the power of a Gothic conqueror, was completed about the beginning of the sixth century. The second period of the decline and fall of Rome may be supposed to commence with the reign of Justinian, who by his laws as well as by his victories restored a transient splendor to the Eastern Empire. It will comprehend the invasion of Italy by the Lombards, the conquest of the Asiatic and African provinces by the Arabs, who embraced the religion of Mohammed, the revolt of the Roman people against the feeble princes of Constantinople, and the elevation of Charlemagne, who in the year 800 established the second, or German, empire of the West. The last and longest of these periods includes about six centuries and a half, from the revival of the Western Empire till the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, and the extinction of a degenerate race of princes, who continued to assume the titles of Caesar and Augustus, after their dominions were contracted to the limits of a single city, in which the language as well as manners of the ancient Romans had been long since forgotten. The writer who should undertake to relate the events of this period would find himself obliged to enter into the general history of the Crusades, as far as they contributed to the ruin of the Greek Empire, and he would scarcely be able to restrain his curiosity from making some inquiry into the state of the city of Rome, during the darkness and confusion of the Middle Ages. As I have ventured, perhaps too hastily, to commit to the press a work which, in every sense of the word, deserves the epithet of imperfect, I consider myself as contracting an engagement to finish, most probably in a second volume, the first of these memorable periods, and to deliver to the public the complete history of the decline and fall of Rome, from the age of the Antonines to the subversion of the Western Empire. With regard to the subsequent periods, though I may entertain some hopes, I dare not presume to give any assurances. The execution of the extensive plan which I have described would connect the ancient and modern history of the world but it would require many years of health, of leisure, and of perseverance. Bentnick Street, February 1st, 1776 Edition The entire history, which is now published, of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the West, abundantly discharges my engagements with the public. Perhaps their favorable opinion may encourage me to prosecute a work which, however laborious it may seem, is the most agreeable occupation of my leisure hours. Bentnick Street, March 1st, 1781 Addition An author easily persuades himself that the public opinion is still favorable to his labors, and I have now embraced the serious resolution of proceeding to the last period of my original design, and of the Roman Empire, the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, in the year 1453. The most patient reader, who computes that three ponderous volumes have already been employed on the events of four centuries, may perhaps be alarmed at the long prospect of nine hundred years. But it is not my intention to expatiate with the same minuteness on the whole series of the Byzantine history. At our entrance into this period, 
the reign of Justinian, and the conquests of the Mohammedans will deserve and detain our attention, and the last age of Constantinople, the Crusades and Turks, is connected with the revolutions of modern Europe. From the seventh to the eleventh century, the obscure interval will be supplied by a concise narrative of such facts as may still appear either interesting or important. Bentnick Street, March 1st, 1782 Preface to the First Volume Diligence and accuracy are the only merits to which an historical writer may ascribe to himself if any merit indeed can be assumed from the performance of an indispensable duty. I may therefore be allowed to say that I have carefully examined all the original materials that could illustrate the subject which I had undertaken to treat. Should I ever complete the extensive design which has been sketched out in the preface, I might perhaps conclude it with a critical account of the authors consulted during the progress of the whole work, and however such an attempt might incur the censure of ostentation, I am persuaded that it would be susceptible of entertainment, as well as information. At present I shall content myself with a single observation. The biographers who, under the reigns of Diocletian and Constantine, composed, or rather compiled, the lives of the emperors, from Hadrian to the sons of Carus, are usually mentioned under the names of Aelius Spartianus, Julius Capitolinus, Aelius Limpridius, Volcatius Gallicanus, Trebilius Polio, and Flavius Vopiscus. But there is so much perplexity in the titles of the manuscripts, and so many disputes that have arisen among the critics concerning their number, their names, and their respective property, that for the most part I have quoted them without distinction, under the general and well-known title of the Augustan History. Preface to the fourth volume of the original quarto edition. I now discharge my promise, and complete my design, of writing the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, both in the West and in the East. The whole period extends from the age of Trajan and the Antonines to the taking of Constantinople by Mohammed the Second, and includes a review of the Crusades and the state of Rome during the Middle Ages. Since the publication of my first volume, twelve years have elapsed, twelve years, according to my wish, of health, of leisure, and of perseverance. I may now congratulate my deliverance from a long and laborious service, and my satisfaction will be pure and perfect if the public favour should be extended to the conclusion of my work. It was my first intention to have collected, under one view, the numerous authors of every age and language from whom I have derived the materials of this history, and I am still convinced that the apparent ostentation would be more than compensated by real use. If I have renounced this idea, if I have declined an undertaking which had obtained the approbation of a master artist, my excuse may be found in the extreme difficulty of assigning a proper measure to such a catalogue. A naked list of names and editions would not be satisfactory either to myself or my readers. The characters of the principal authors of the Roman and Byzantine history have been occasionally connected with the events which they describe. A more copious and critical enquiry might indeed deserve, but it would demand, an elaborate volume which might swell by degrees into a general library of historical writers. For the present, I shall content myself with renewing my serious protestation that I have always endeavoured to draw from my fountainhead, that my curiosity, as well as a sense of duty, has always urged me to study the originals, and that if they have sometimes eluded my search, I have carefully marked the secondary evidence, on whose faith a passage or fact were reduced to depend. I shall soon revisit the banks of the Lake of Lausanne, a country which I have known and loved from my early youth, under a mild government, amidst a beauteous landscape, in a life of leisure and independence, and among a people of easy and elegant manners, I have enjoyed, and may again hope to enjoy, the varied pleasures of retirement and society. But I shall ever glory in the name and character of an Englishman. I am proud of my birth in a free and enlightened country, and the approbation of that country is the best and most honourable reward of my labours. Were I ambitious of any other patron than the public, I would inscribe this work to a statesman, who in a long, a stormy, and at length an unfortunate administration, had many political opponents, almost without a personal enemy, who has retained in his fall from power many faithful and disinterested friends, and who under the pressure of severe infirmity enjoys the lively vigour of his mind, and the felicity of his incomparable temper. 
Lord North will permit me to express the feelings of friendship in the language of truth, but even truth and friendship should be silent if he is still dispensed the favours of the crown. In a remote solitude, vanity may still whisper in my ear that my readers, perhaps, may inquire whether, in the conclusion of the present work, I am now taking an everlasting farewell. They shall hear all that I know myself, and all that I could reveal to the most intimate friend. The motives of action or silence are now equally balanced, nor can I pronounce in my most secret thoughts on which side the scale will preponderate. I cannot dissemble that six quartos must have tried, and may have exhausted, the indulgence of the public, that in the repetition of similar attempts a successful author has much more to lose than he can hope to gain, that I am now descending into the vale of years, and that the most respectable of my countrymen, the men whom I aspire to imitate, have resigned the pen of history about the same period of their lives. Yet I consider that the annals of ancient and modern times may afford many rich and interesting subjects, that I am still possessed of health and leisure, that by the practice of writing some skill and facility must be acquired, and that in the ardent pursuit of truth and knowledge I am not conscious of decay. To an active mind, indolence is more painful than labour, and the first months of my liberty will be occupied and amused in the excursions of curiosity and taste. By such temptations I have been sometimes seduced from the rigid duty even of a pleasing and voluntary task, but my time will now be my own, and in the use or abuse of independence I shall no longer fear my own reproaches or those of my friends. I am fairly entitled to a year of jubilee. Next summer and the following winter will rapidly pass away, and experience only can determine whether I shall still prefer the freedom and variety of study to the design and composition of a regular work, which animates while it confines the daily application of the author. Caprice and accident may influence my choice, but the dexterity of self-love will contrive to applaud either active industry or philosophic repose. Downing Street, May 1st, 1788 Addition. I shall embrace this opportunity of introducing two verbal remarks, which have not conveniently offered themselves to my notice. 1. As often as I use the definitions of beyond the Alps, the Rhine, the Danube, etc., and generally suppose myself at Rome, and afterwards at Constantinople, without observing whether this relative geography may agree with the local, but variable, situation of the reader or the historian. 2. In proper names of foreign, and especially of oriental origin, it should always be our aim to express in our English version a faithful copy of the original. But this rule, which is founded on a just regard to uniformity and truth, must often be relaxed, and the exceptions will be limited or enlarged by the custom of the language and the taste of the interpreter. Our alphabets may often be defective. A harsh sound, an uncouth spelling, might offend the ear or eye of our countrymen. And some words, notoriously corrupt, are fixed, as it were, naturalized in the vulgar tongue. The Prophet Mohammed can no longer be stripped of the famous, though improper, appellation of Mahomet. The well-known cities of Aleppo, Damascus, and Cairo would be almost lost in the strange descriptions of Haleb, Damashk, and Al-Kahira. The titles and offices of the Ottoman Empire are fashioned by the practice of three hundred years, and we are pleased to blend the three Chinese monosyllables, Confuci, in the respectable name of Confucius, or even to adopt the Persian corruption of Mandarin. But I would vary the use of Zoroaster and Sertusht, as I drew my information from Greece or Persia, since our connection with India, the genuine Timur, is restored to the throne of Tamerlane. Our most correct writers have retrenched the Al, the superfluous article from the Koran, and we escape an ambiguous termination by adopting Moslem instead of Musulman, in the plural number. In these, and in a thousand examples, the shades of distinction are often minute, and I can feel where I cannot explain the motives of my choice. End of the Prefaces <laughs>